DSI Africa. Hello, I'm Katherine Lawrence of the University of Michigan, where I help to run the Science Gateways Community Institute. I welcome you to the panelists' presentations for the National Institutes of Health funding opportunity for the Open Data Science Platform and Coordinating Center. You're about to hear five exciting talks about initiatives that collect, share, and provide analysis tools for data in a more open and accessible manner. These talks should give you some insights into the opportunities, challenges, and considerations necessary for establishing an open data science platform in service of biomedical research. These projects also provide inspiration for the collaboration that is necessary between individuals, research groups, and larger organizations to achieve broader health science goals. Speakers talk from their homes through video conferencing. Okay, hi. Uh, so I'm Benedict Payton. Um, I'm an associate professor here at UC Santa Cruz, and I am really pleased to come speak to you today. www.databiosphere.org. Okay, thank you. So uh, today I'm going to talk to you about the data biosphere. So our project to try to build an ecosystem of data sets and compute resources um, that kind of connect um, um, a substantial amount of biomedical data. So you know, we've been making amazing progress in the field in generating um, increasingly vast data sets that uh, offer tremendous research uh, capabilities. But one challenge with those data sets is that they're getting very, very large. They're getting so large, in fact, that it's really impractical to download uh, and store them on your personal computer. And so we're entering this world in which um, funding institutions and practicality dictates that it's no longer possible to, you know, to take the data and bring it to you, bring it to your laptop or bring it to your institution, right? We can't afford to have N copies of the data. Um, and so, uh, because if everybody has their own copy of the data, it's expensive, it's hard to enforce security around that data. Um, it creates a lot of redundancy and it also makes it hard to share the data. So we're trying to sort of invert that model and instead have researchers come to the data the data lives in situ on a cloud, um, and alongside that data is available compute that researchers can use to analyze the data. Um, and we can essentially provide resources and services and applications, as I'm going to describe, um, that allow us to both reduce that amount of redundancy, uh, uh, sort of create uh, layers of security and threat detection around the data so that we can know who's accessing it and make sure that. Uh, appropriate responsible research is happening, make it ultimately more accessible to researchers who you know, don't have large institutional uh, compute infrastructure. And you know, because the, the cloud is very elastic, potentially enable uh, larger scale analyses that just weren't possible in the past. In sort of thinking out how to build what we've kind of envis envisioned as data biosphere, we started off with a series of principles that we think are essential for anybody trying to build something in this space. One thing is, is modularity. Whatever we build needs to be composed, decomposed into individual pieces so that each of them can be switched out and, and replaced and made better uh, independently. So we don't build a monolith, essentially. Uh, the system needs to be community focused. That is, uh, we need to, lots and lots of different groups to be able to come in with a diversity of different ideas uh, and, and, and allow those uh, use cases and so forth to be expressed so that what we create is, is fit for those purposes. And it needs to be open, right? So we are, we are, it's great in genomics and biomedicine that we have this open source culture and uh, everything we want to build needs to have that ethos so that anybody can come in and look at the code uh, and, and change it potentially and reuse it and, and create their own versions of these systems. And then finally, um, it needs to be standards based. So as we build uh, you know, modular pieces, they need to, 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 to connect together using standards that are developed by coalitions like the, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. Myself and a, a number of other groups have been building um, uh, sort of components of this data biosphere and a number of projects uh, across NIH and other um, institutions are leveraging uh, what we're doing. So here, just a, actually a few of the projects that we're um, helping to build out as part of the biosphere. Accelerating Medicines Partnership, Parkinson's Disease Biomarkers Program, PDBP, Nurses Health Study, All of Us Research Program, Biobank UK, NHGRI Anvil, Single Cell Portal, Human Cell Atlas, 
NHLBI Top Med, NHLBI Biodata Catalyst. Today, I'm going to just briefly talk about three of them that my group um, is very involved in. Uh, firstly, the NHGRI Anvil project, their uh, cloud platform, uh, then the NHLBI Biodata Catalyst, uh, and then finally, um, the Human Cell Atlas project and the data coordination platform specifically. Um, okay, so firstly, NHGRI Anvil. NHGRI Anvil essentially is, the, uh, is NHGRI's uh, cloud platform in which they want to store data sets that are generated by NHGRI researchers and make them accessible. Um, it's a cloud-based infrastructure, as I said. Um, it's highly elastic. Um, it enables researchers to gain access to the data, clinical data, um, data about phenotypes and metadata. Um, and it needs to work around uh, the sort of data access requirements that we have to ensure that uh, only authentic, uh, you know, authorized, authenticated uh, research can take place. And it wants to provide a collaborative research environment in which researchers can kind of come together and analyze that data, as I say, uh, in situ. Um, so Anvil provides a number of interesting capabilities. So we have essentially a place to go and search for the data and find the data and query the data. That's Gen 3. We have the Terra uh, workbench environment, which you can think of as being a little bit like Google Docs, but for research on large data sets. So you can essentially bring a data set into a workspace and then with other researchers collaboratively analyze that data. We have the Doc Store, which is a um, platform for creating reproducible um, containerized workflows and for sharing them and making them openly available. And then we have a number of applications. So you can use uh, computational notebooks like Jupyter Notebooks, you can use Galaxy, you can use Bioconductor, and you can do all of that within uh, the Anvil space. And there are lots and lots of capabilities and services that are being added to this uh, over time. Anvil is currently all built out and deployed using the Google Cloud Platform uh, and, we look, uh, and it operates within uh, a FISMA uh, moderate security perimeter so that, uh, so that everything that we do essentially um, has a rigorous, robust security um, uh, guarantees around it so that we can manage uh, and hold managed access data. If you're interested in Anvil, then please go look at anvilproject.org. Uh, from there, you can navigate find out information about the project. You can go and see which data sets are already in there. We already have um, a substantial amount of data in there. You can find training materials and all sorts of stuff to onboard you to use all of these different resources. Okay, so that's Anvil and very much it builds, the, it builds on the components uh, of the biosphere that we're trying to build. Uh, a sister project to Anvil is the NHLBI uh, Biodata Catalyst. Biodatacatalyst.nhlbi.nih.gov and by, I'm not going to go into all the details here, but uh, Biodata Catalyst is basically the same thing, but for NHLBI. Um, and so similarly, NHLBI has data sets that are of very great value to it. Uh, in particular right now, the TopMed project, which is a project of 150,000 um, uh, participants and whole genome sequences for them, uh, organized um, and a whole bunch of phenotype and metadata. Uh, and the Biodata Catalyst is making all of that data available to top med researchers and ultimately researchers beyond um, and across NHLBI. Uh, and just like Anvil, we're leveraging many of the same components that I just talked about for Anvil within Biodata Catalyst and then some additional things that are specific and specialized to the requirements and use cases that NHLBI has. So just like Anvil, if you come to Biodata Catalyst, you're going to see a very similar uh, set of tools and environment uh, ways to access the data, work on the data, use workflows with the data. Um, but we also add and interoperate with the Seven Bridges platform, and we have additional clinical applications through the Picture uh, system that allows you to explore more clinical data. So again, very much the same underlying uh, biosphere, but a different set of use cases and data. And then finally, I just want to mention the Human Cell Atlas project. So uh, the Human Cell Atlas project is an attempt to kind of create uh, essentially a complete atlas of all the human uh, cell types and cell states uh, that exist in our body uh, and is leveraging the many, many, many uh, single cell technologies that have been uh, created over the last uh, few years. Uh, and Human Cell Atlas, which you can go to at this uh, URL, data.humancellatlas.org, um, is, is generally mostly open 
the data set, the data is all public, uh, and it also leverages and builds on all of the uh, ecosystem data components that I talked about earlier. Uh, for example, if you if you hit up uh, the URL above uh, to go and see data at humancelloutlets.org, uh, you can go and find millions of cells of specific organs. Uh, and you can see clusterings and all sorts of single cell analyses to get into them. But you can then take them and bring them into, uh, for example, the Terra workspace environment and analyze that and potentially analyze that in conjunction with projects with data from Anvil uh, and from Biodata Catalyst. So I just want to end uh, by saying that, you know, in trying to build the underlying uh, software infrastructure to make this all work, we're really thinking, I mentioned this at the beginning, but it's worth so sort of double emphasizing that the biosphere and the components that are in the biosphere um, are building on APIs and, uh, in, and standards and interfaces that have been pioneered by uh, standards bodies like the GA4GH. And by doing that, we're going to make it easier uh, and simpler for other groups to come and reuse what we've created and indeed interoperate with us by standing up their own services, uh, and their own systems, and allowing data to be sort of uh, analyzed across these platforms because that's where we want to get to and not not a siloed world but a world in which things interoperate okay and with that I just want to thank um, the large number of people who were involved in this project uh, both at UC Santa Cruz uh, and then at UC, uh, University of Chicago at the Broad Institute at Vanderbilt at OICR um, at Human Cell Atlas um, and uh, our funders and the folks in specific projects uh, like Tophead and GTEx. Hi, I'm Nikki Mulder. I head the Computational Biology Division at the University of Cape Town and I lead H3 Abarnet, which is a Pan-African Bioinformatics Network. So I'm going to be talking about H3 Abarnet, which is a Pan-African Bioinformatics Network, and I am Nikki Mulder. I run this network. So there's no doubt about the importance of African genomic data. This is both human and, and pathogen data. We have a disproportionate burden of disease in Africa. And the, the genomes of, of African populations are very diverse and very different to other populations. And the global importance of this is, is a, due to the fact that people and pathogens move around the continent and they move around uh, different countries. So I'm going to be talking about a particular case study, which is where H3 Abana was set up for the Human Hereditary and Health in Africa, or H3 Africa. This is a big initiative funded by the NIH and the Wellcome Trust, now through AISA to study the genetic and environmental basis for a number of different diseases. You can see there's a list of diseases um, that are being studied on the left. Cardiovascular diseases, infectious diseases, developmental disorders, mental health, monogenic diseases, microbiomes. And the project involves a number of different components. So they are, are research projects, collaborative centers, and then the infrastructural components are biorepositories and a bioinformatics network. Now this, Consortium is generating a huge number of, of um, amount of data and samples for more than 75,000 participants across the continent. So this includes phenotype and genomic data for human and pathogens, as well as some microbiome sequence data. Now this data gets deposited in the EGA and the ENA so that it's available to the world. And the samples are being deposited in one of the three biorepositories funded by h Africa. So this obviously brings a lot of uh, bioinformatics needs associated with all the data and metadata. And so um, there was a need to build up an infrastructure to manage this data. So that's where HRA Bionet comes in. So this is an informatics network. It's spread across 17 countries and uh, 28 partners. And there are more than 200 members of this. And the aim was to develop infrastructure for genomics research across the continent. So the role of h 3 Bionet in, in Asia Africa and generally in genomics projects is to build a computing infrastructure and access to computing, to provide containerized workflows for data analysis and support for these, to standardize and harmonize data so that, that uh, it's use more valuable to the public and to enable meta-analysis, to submit the data to the public repository, so acting as the central data coordinating center, generally to make all the materials and the data fair, and uh, therefore accessible as well via a, a catalog. And on top of all of this, of course, is building the necessary skills to, to address all of these issues. So starting with the building of a computing infrastructure, so HRA Barnett from the beginning started putting in, in computers and servers in various different places around the continent and training systems administrators on how to 
uh, run bioinformatics applications um, on this computing infrastructure. We also developed and been working with uh, different <clears throat> modes of, of data transfer, uh, single sign-on, authentication and authorization, etc. So the next component was really building the, the analysis tools and, and the workflows. So we were trying here to focus on African relevant tools and so not reinventing the wheel where there were good tools out there already. So we're building an African reference graph to improve variant calling. We've got a, an imputation service on an African reference panel that can't be made public. We're building many other tools that are associated with using data and transforming that data into, into biomedical knowledge. To put all these tools together, uh, we've built a whole lot of analysis workflows. So we've built uh, uh, SOPs so that we can, you can see exactly what processes need to be followed for the major h Africa data analysis uh, types, which is whole genome, uh, microbiomes, GWAS, et cetera. And then what we did with those is we then built containerized workflows for each of these. And these are all available publicly on Quio.io and, and in the GitHub repository. And these have been used for the analysis of, of various different data sets from Estre Africa, as well as an imputation service that we run and um, for many of our training programs. The next component is data management and support. So there's a, uh, a lot of different data. There's, met, there's the metadata associated with biospecimens, they are with clinical data and there's omics data. And for the uh, clinical metadata, what we've been working on is building standards and um, basically determining what data elements should be collected and how those should be collected and then mapping these to ontologies and then building standard uh, case report from, forms from these. And then post hoc harmonization is also important because a lot of data was collected before these, these standards were, were, were developed. And so we're also developing algorithms to map existing data to um, a minimum data metadata model. So just as an example of some of the standardized components that we're building, so there's a core set of phenotypes and that's a standard CRF, we call it. And then we've got module specific, um, disease specific modules or environmental modules, and there's pediatric modules that can be tagged on so that um, we then build a, a red cap data dictionary and templates so that users can come and build standard CRFs from these by adding these different modules together. The other component obviously of data is the movement storage and, and submission and access uh, to this data. So we were tasked early on in the consortium to build an Asia Africa data archive and be the coordinating center for submission of data to the public repositories, which are the EGA and um, the ENA for, for non-human data. So we built a secure system um, based on the architecture in EGA where you have um, encryption and, and landing areas and vaults and then um, the secure sort of cold storage. And we have, uh, the, the aim of this is for us to ingest the h Africa data once it's generated. And then within the timelines specified by the h Africa data sharing access and release policy, prepare the data for submission to the EGA. So we've submitted 14 African data sets to the EGA so far, and that's more than 140 terabytes of data. And then obviously we now need to make all of these outputs accessible and findable and interoperable and reusable. So we have um, so the data gets submitted to the EGA and the ENA. We've built a catalog, which I'll show you next, um, to enable searching of this metadata. But the interoperable part we keep, we make sure we've got stable identifiers. We map all the data to ontologies wherever possible. And then we have also access uh, mapping to the data use ontology to show what the access requirements are or access limitations might be. And wherever possible, we adopt GA4GH standards. It's a global alliance for genomics and health. This is the this screenshot is of the new edge traffic data and biospecimen catalog. So users can come in, search for what data exists in the archive, what biospecimens are sitting in the biorepositories. Once you log in, you can then submit an online access request form, which then gets evaluated by the Data and Biospecimen Access Committee. And then finally, we have to, we have a huge com uh, training component in h Bionet because they are all things data related and we, we have a huge number of different audiences from basic bio, uh, data users to systems administrators and, and senior bioinformaticians. So we have a multimodal approach to training. This is the training trainers to, to ensure long-term sustainability. 
We run face-to-face -face workshops. We've organized more than 30 face-to-face -face workshops so far. We have, we host interns. And then our flagship program is actually a live online training where we have remote classrooms and a live online training that reaches up to a thousand participants at any one time over a four month period. We also run hackathons and data jamborees, which are very goal oriented to come out with either analysis or a new tool. So in summary, we've developed expertise in genomic data analysis, workflow development, data management, data harmonization, We've got a lot of experience in building red, red cap clinical databases now. And then the tools that we use, we've developed are to pull all the data together in a data science -y kind of mode and, and, and convert the data into knowledge and then ideally finally into application. We've built the, the related infrastructure that you require for all this to happen, including the computing, the workflows, the storage, and just moving of data. So though this was primarily focused on genomics uh, for humans, this infrastructure can be extended to all other kinds of biomedical data very easily. With that, I'd like to acknowledge the Estuary Bino Consortium. The project's divided into different work packages led by these work package chairs and co-chairs. We have a very able and competent technical team at, at Estuary Bino Central at UCT, and I'd like to acknowledge the funding from the NIH Common Fund. Thank you for your attention. So good day, uh, my name is Susan Feltzman. I'm the director of the scholarly publishing program at the Academy of Science of South Africa. My program is involved in the research of research outputs in South Africa, research and integrity. And we also involved in um, open science, not only in South Africa, but also have a pan-African focus through the academies in Africa as such. So this afternoon, I would like to talk about a project called the African Open Science Project. This project was an outcome of the International Science Council's document, Open Data in a Big Data World. It was a three-year project running from October 2016 to October 2019. So the first phase, namely the pilot phase, has come to an end now, and we are currently busy setting up phase one of this particular project. It was um, funded by the Department of Science and Technology through the National Research Foundation, and it was managed by the Academy of Science of South Africa. This pilot study had seven very specific deliverables it had to deliver to the donor funder, namely that we had to establish an African Open Data Forum. It's a little bit deceiving if you look at our title, namely the African Open Science Platform, because I'm sure in this audience that we're speaking to, um, in this particular panel, um, it rings a bell of software and hardware and infrastructure, etc. But it wasn't in the pilot phase. Our main goal was actually just to establish a forum whereby we could create a place where African scientists and researchers could discuss open science and open data as such. And also a forum in which we could connect the dots because that was the main focus of this project is to connect the activities in terms of open science and open data on the African continent. So this project was launched in, at the Science Forum South Africa in 2016. And I think what is very important to note, which I will not deal with um, today, and that is that we had to compile a framework for open data policies a framework for incentives for sharing research data, which was a very important one, as we did find mainly that researchers in Africa did not re share their data because of many complex um, issues and reasons. And then we also compiled a framework for capacity building in research in open data. The one that I'll touch upon this afternoon is the roadmap and the framework for e-infrastructure. And then also just perhaps explore a little bit of what we found in the landscape report on open science and open data in Africa. I want to flag at this point, since we are talking about health data, that there are numerous challenges that we found that researchers um, were encountered with when they collected their data. I must add that this is not just particular to health data. It is collecting any data within the African continent. Researchers found that sometimes the funder contracts were quite binding, and sometimes the data were used and reused and also curated under very special conditions and not always to the benefit of that particular country. There was also a delay in sharing data um, that was collected. There were gaps in the data. 
There's a lack of adherence to international standards. There was uncertainty about the intellectual property rights, um, who was the data owners, and was, is, this trust, uh, is this data to be trusted? Um, as sometimes there is a feeling out there um, from other countries is that data from Africa is, is, is perhaps dubious. So protecting the privacy of research subjects and what security is around these data, um, these are important challenges that we are facing. And of course, the absence of patient consent was a big concern, um, considering under the circumstances in which these um, data have to be um, collected. And of course, the adherence to fair principles. I think some of the things that I've mentioned actually resonates with the previous speakers um, in which they highlight that it is important to set up a proper data repository that is recognized in the world as, as a trusted repository. It was important for us to understand what open science activities were taking place on the continent. And it was sort of connected to political willingness um, we struggled with the word political, um, but in the end, it is governments that funds research and development within the particular countries. We also found that research is funded in Africa through external resources and not necessarily through governments of the particular countries. There were a few countries that we could see that there were movement from the governments to fund the research and development. So we developed a particular grid to understand where would it be sensible in planning this project further, where we could start discussions on open science and open data and collaborative projects. A map of open science activities and political willingness showing numerous African countries and open science activities taking place within them. As you can see, um, some of the countries of, um, of Africa, there are high density of these particular dots. And that was quite indicative to us that those countries were in a particular position and perhaps more ready than other countries to start discussions on open science. We did find that there were many open science, open access and open data projects on the continent. They are decentralized and not very visible to the outside world of many reasons if we look at the registries where you can actually register, for instance, your data repository. They were very low on the radar and Africa is not very well in enhancing its footprint into the world of sharing data as such. African ICT landscape. This to me is a very important map showing connectivity in Africa. This, uh, this is a map depicting the research and education networks which we consider as being very important when we start to talk about infrastructures, connectivity, collaborations, sharing of data, etc. So what we have here is on, on the eastern side of, of Africa is a very well organized group of countries that group themselves under the SADC, the Southern African countries, not only politically, but also geographical. That's a very, that's the oldest uh, consortium of research and education networks in Africa. You can see they, they're very well organized, not also in terms of high performance computing centers, and then the SKA. Square kilometer array. In other words, the astronomy to which um, Professor Russ Taylor would talk about um, in, in his talk. And then science gateways, you can see that, that the population thereof is much higher in the southern countries. On the northern border, borders, we have ASRIN, that's Arabic countries, that's a very young consortium of research and education networks, but you can only see two countries being connected. And then, of course, on the western coast um, is the um, is Wakrin with only two countries being connected. So you can see that there are still many countries in Africa not connected to research and education network. And when we start talking about collaborations, that these connections are extremely important. There are also a lot of discussions about what are the possibility of mobile connections to deliver on these um, data sharing and collaborations as such. Um, this is a graph that shows you that in 2016, 70%, um, I think maybe let me just retract and say that we know that the mobile connections in penetration in Africa 
are very high. But if we actually look at the breakdown, 70% of it is 2G. And if we look at 28%, it's 3G. And we look at 2%, it's 4G. And it's only from 2020 where Africa started to look at 5G as a possible mobile connection mode um, for Africa. But still projections are that it will going to be very low. Um, and the penetration is also not what uh, initially was thought. And mainly for the moment is because of the cost of mobile connections in Africa as such. So if we just scan through the infrastructure challenges, I think it's a very sort of a gloomy picture that I'll be um, showing here, but I think it's important if we talk about data sharing. The previous speaker, um, Benedict, um, talked about um, some wonderful ideas that crossed our mind when we looked at possible solutions for Africa, but the situation is still dire. So there are selected governments who has a very low awareness of the value of research and education networks. And some networks, as I've shown, is not operational with low and even no budgets. The biggest problem is that commercial public internet service providers is a threat to research and education networks. And whilst the research and education networks do far more than just being an ISP, there's a huge monopoly by these commercial public internet service providers, especially in Central and West Africa. So much so that they close down the access to cable landing stations and they would not allow other competitors into the market, keeping the costs extremely high in terms of the connectivity. Power outages on the continent interrupting the internet service delivery is rife. Um, it is a common problem um, in the countries. And of course, when we interrupt internet services, we also interrupt science. At one stage, we did think that cloud services would be the ideal, considering that all the um, hardware and software is sitting in the cloud and it can be pushed to the researchers network in terms of the access. But again, it is very expensive. We do find that in the three year period that we were looking in this project, that the costs are coming down and there are more role players in this field. So the competition based are much higher. When um, Professor Nicky Miller spoke about H3A Bionet, of course, this was one of our um, landmark projects in, in the project as such, uh, because of the work they've done. And I, I don't have to convince you about the excellent work they're doing and how they're actually going about to construct these data repositories. But they're making also use of medium scale server infrastructure. Um, lots of problems about the data not being trusted. And of course, the infrastructure is not funded, funded. So the sustainability and the maintenance and the curation of the data on those platforms are highly problematic. We also find that researchers have a small number of computer workstations and that sometimes even donated servers and software are already outdated. Data management is also a main problem. Data management plans are not the norm and that's due to the lack of policies and funder requirements within these particular countries. And the biggest problem is that there's a lack of centralized secure infrastructure that makes collaboration and data sharing and storage impossible in some cases. Um, just for your information, we only have one core trust seal repository on our continent and sitting right in Cape Town um, at UCT. So there are few repositories that use proper data repository software or science gateways and that they have tailor-made for their purpose. And of course, the non-adherence to international best practice regarding persistent identifiers, metadata, licensing, intellectual property rights, data citation, archiving and backup of data is still problematic and still we need to re, uh, raise um, awareness about these very important issues when setting up repositories. There's no incentivization to share data because the researchers want to exhaust publication possibilities before they actually share the data. And of course, the training of the researchers in the new role of data collectors and curators are also very important. And because suddenly researchers are expected to be knowledgeable and trained in these areas as well. 
So what is the key then to a future African Open Science Platform? First and very important is the collaboration, not only among countries or institutions and projects, researchers and funders, resources need to be shared and we need to ensure that there's a free flow of data, research and the knowledge. For me, very important that I've learned right through this project is the trust in relationships. We have to build trust. We have to be open and we have to be transparent. Researchers want to trust others for having their best interest at heart and not because of the profits they can make um, from the research being conducted in Africa. It must be researcher driven. Right at the end of our project, I think that was the biggest missing link in all the work we did is the fact that researchers were not necessarily included when setting up the infrastructures to um, collect the data from and the needs of the researchers need to be addressed. Infrastructural investment and we have to keep momentum in the activities that's already taking place on the continent. We need strong leadership and we need to build on the knowledge that has been gained over the last couple of years. I want to thank you for this time and this opportunity to participate in this discussion and very specifically our funders, the South African Department of Science and Technology and uh, Mrs. Ina Smith, who spent much of her time in the three years to make a success of this project. I thank you very much. Email susan at assaf.org.za Hello everyone, uh, my name is Russ Taylor. I'm a professor and research chair jointly between the University of Cape Town and the University of the Western Cape in South Africa, and the director of the Inter-University Institute for Data Intensive Astronomy. Hello, I'm, I'm gonna be talking about a, a big data challenge coming to the African continent, um, a challenge driven by, by astronomy, and I'll talk about the solutions that we're working on to address that challenge. But over the course of my presentation, uh, you'll see that there are many common aspects of this challenge to the challenges being faced in the medical community in bioinformatics. And in fact, uh, you're currently working with bioinformatics researchers and adapting this technology for uh, their research. So the, uh, the challenge coming to Africa uh, arises from uh, a big astronomy project in radio astronomy called the Square Kilometer Array. This is a large global mega science project involving uh, 12 countries around the world. Um, Africa plays a key role in this project uh, because a major part of the infrastructure for this telescope is coming to the African continent. And that's shown on this next slide um, where I've depicted in yellow uh, on the African map, the locations of the infrastructure elements of the square kilometer array uh, as they will be deployed out over the next 10 years. And you see that infrastructure spans everything, uh, many countries in the southern part of Africa, out into Madagascar and Mauritius in the Indian Ocean, and Kenya and Ghana in, in the northern part of Africa. So it's a highly distributed project involving uh, many stakeholders on the African continent. Uh, and it also uh, involves very large data. Uh, in this slide, I'm showing a plot of the, the scale of data sets that are being created by major astronomy projects uh, as a function of time, uh, where the size of the data is plotted uh, vertically on this axis uh, logarithmically. So a straight line on this plot indicates an exponential growth in data. And you see over the last two decades from about 2000 to 220, there's been a, an exponential growth uh, with a doubling time of about uh, two years. Uh, and that growth has happened largely outside of Africa, well, entirely outside of Africa, primarily in North America and Europe. Um, and you also see on this plot that there's a kink in that curve starting right about now with a faster growth over the next 10 years, the next 20 years, and that growth is happening in Africa, largely driven by the Square Kilometer Array project. And we need to develop solutions in Africa for dealing with that data if African researchers are going to be part of the research uh, leadership in these astronomy projects. So that's our challenge. Um, the other aspect of this challenge, of course, is that by moving towards these large uh, global mega science unique projects, uh, we have a dynamic in which uh, the entire global community uh, is going to be given access to this, this project. And this project will address 
large key um, science challenges in astronomy, uh, which are of interest to large global teams. And so we have to have, have a situation where this uh, telescope's producing these very, very large data sets, uh, eventually exascale data sets, uh, and teams all over the world are gonna wanna work on it. And, and as you heard earlier in this, uh, this panel, uh, this is a common challenge to bioinformatics and biological research as well, that we have uh, data challenges and distributed teams all working on the data. And there's no way that every researcher can have this data on their local computer. So we're facing a different dynamic in terms of how to do science, uh, both in terms of the technology and the sociology. Um, this uh, challenge was already recognized uh, almost a decade ago now. Um, and I'm showing here a quote from a book written by Al Gore, a book entitled The Futuristic Drivers of Global Change. The quote reads what to do? To develop a new generation of computer technology to store and process the data soon to be captured by the Square Kilometer Array, a new radio telescope that will collect each day twice the amount of information presently generated on the entire World Wide Web. And you recognize that projects like the Square Kilometer Array, which are going to capture every day twice the amount of information currently on the internet worldwide, uh, means we have to do things differently. And we need to harness the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution uh, to solve this challenge. And one of the um, new modalities that is being opened up by these new technologies is the ability to collaborate on projects uh, among diverse and distributed teams. We no longer have the old model of hierarchical uh, in-house solutions to problems, but we now can harness the, the diverse talents of, of a global community if we can provide them the means to work with the data and to bring their uh, knowledge and uh, expertise to bear in the problems. So that's, that's the challenge that we're facing. And, uh, and we see cloud computing as uh, one of the key elements of the solution to that challenge. And we've established um, in South Africa, a cloud computing facility dedicated to data intensive research. It's a, it's a custom cloud that we built uh, in-house in South Africa, it's called Ilifu. Ilifu.ac.za. And I am the project lead on that project. And you see in the bottom of this slide, the logos of the partners. Uh, we have five South African universities involved in the project. We have the Square Kilometer Array project. And we also have the uh, South African government through their national integrated cyber infrastructure um, system and strategic plan. Um, so between all these partners, we've jointly funded the development of, of a cloud. Uh, to work with big data uh, driven by the, the development of the square kilometer array. ILIFU, program priorities. Um, but in fact, with the LUFU, we, we've targeted four strategic areas um, to address. Uh, of course, the key one is astronomy, um, uh, solving data intensive priorities uh, for the projects leading up to the square kilometer array. We're also working with bioinformatics researchers at the University of Western Cape, at the University of Cape Town and Stellenbosch Universities. The uh, lead university of Cape Town researcher is Nikki Mulder, who you heard earlier in this uh, talk, and some of the work she talked about is being uh, done on the Glyphu system. We also have a team working on research data management, uh, how to uh, effectively manage the data outputs of the science programs. Um, and we're also working on the next step in technology, which is to federate this cloud uh, among a globally distributed network of, uh, of cloud providers um, uh, to build an international network uh, and, a, and a commons for building, working with big data and astronomy. So this, this, this uh, graphic sort of shows you the modalities and with, with which the cloud provides services uh, to the researchers and how we empower the end researcher to work with the big data. So everything on, on the left in this diagram in the, in the dashed box is hidden from the, the user. Uh, but it contains all of the technologies that we need to deploy to provide platforms and services so that researchers can work with big data. And on the right are the interfaces that users can use to access the resources. Um, we have, uh, like you heard earlier, uh, uh, in the bioinformatics domain, uh, we have a Jupyter Lab environment, uh, which allows users to, to fire up as a, as a web service, um, a, a programming environment which provides access to the virtualized computing environment in the cloud and also all the data uh, for which a user has authorization to access. 
So all, all the computing power and the platforms and the data are hidden behind the Jupyter interface. Um, so there's a very powerful computing environment uh, that they're tapping into with the interface. For the real geeks, we have the command line uh, shell access. Uh, we also have capability for projects to manage their own resources and users through an OpenStack tenant environment. And we've developed a visualization uh, system, a, a, a server client model for visualization where all of the heavy liftings happens on the cloud, but the user interfaces this through a web environment. So you can visualize um, tens of terabyte size data sets with your iPhone if you, uh, if you wish. So that's, uh, that's the basic architecture of Elifu and the way users interact. Um, this is a plot showing uh, since the uh, launch of Elifu in 2018, the growth of our user base. The blue graph shows our astronomy users and the red graph shows our total users and the difference between astronomy and total is the bioinformatics use of the system, which you can see is growing uh, with time and now represents about 10% uh, of our users. Um, I like to show this plot because it shows the distribution of users on the system by country and institution. Um, and what you're seeing here is that about 70% of the users are from within South Africa, uh, but 30% come globally, uh, primarily from the UK, the Netherlands, the USA, and, and several European countries. And um, when the SK project came to Africa, there was a concern that uh, we might be confronted with the old paradigm of the African science and engagement with the user international community where data is produced in Africa but then shipped offshore to uh, you know, the US or, or, or Europe institutions uh, for data processing and, and harvesting the research from the data uh, and where Africa becomes a provider of data but not, not as engaged in, in, in the actual leading in research. So this, this graphic shows that what would be set up here is, this, is a cloud system which actually is servicing users in South Africa and empowering users to work with big data, but it's also a system that's used globally uh, by our collaborators on these projects. So it's, uh, it, it, it models both the, the fact that we are building a system that empowers African users, but also it's, it's a global partnership and involves uh, research with institutions around the world. Uh, an important aspect of this system is the training aspect, uh, which demonstrates two things. Uh, one, the, the capability to reach out anywhere in Africa to bring researchers to the data. Um, and also the, uh, the great opportunity for empowering and exciting a, a new generation of researchers all across Africa uh, in this new paradigm of working with, with big data sets and, and doing research. So what I'm showing here is a, uh, an event we hosted in, in, in Madagascar uh, last year. Uh, and you see a bunch of students clustered around a table in a, uh, a basically a hotel in northern Madagascar using the hotel internet to connect to the Elifu cloud and running big data problems uh, on that cloud. And so basically you don't need great connectivity to work with this data, you just need connectivity, basic connectivity, mobile connectivity is enough because all the heavy lifting is done in the cloud. And so this, this provides access to researchers anywhere in Africa um, to working with the big data sets. And here's another picture of a, of a similar kind of event in, hosted in Botswana um, also last year. So it's, it's, it really is a, a powerful new paradigm for enabling end users to work with big data uh, and uh, without having to have massive resources uh, where you are. The other aspect of the cloud is, of course, the, the impact on open science and reproducibility. Uh, it's recognized, uh, I'm showing here some, uh, some excerpts from uh, an article in Nature and uh, notes from a conference uh, at the Turing Institute in the UK last, in 2016, about how the cloud opens up a new possibility for open science. Uh, the, the fact that the, the, soft, the execution environment is virtualized it means it's decoupled from any particular hardware or any location. The fact that we can capture uh, all of the software and the data and the execution in a container means that it's, it's transportable to, uh, to any, uh, any other cloud around the world. So it offers a, a technology to underpin a, a, a mode for open science around big data sets. And we've begun a conversation with global partners about building a federated cloud environment which would 
um, not only build a common ecosystem for working with big data sets and astronomy, but also be a platform this, for this open science mode uh, where we can distribute um, and reproduce scientific results anywhere uh, uh, within the federated cloud environment um, for researchers. Um, I'll, just, I'll just wrap up by, uh, you heard earlier from Susan Belsman about the African Open Science Platform. Um, my institute idea was in, engaged with, the, uh, with Ina and Susan in developing the uh, framework and roadmap. And we believe that cloud technology and federated cloud technology will be a key underpinning to building the kind of platform that we need for open science in a pan-African context. Um, we are, we are um, looking forward to working uh, with the Open Science Platform project uh, to make that a reality. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I think that uh, developments in Africa are happening quite rapidly uh, and we are working to solve big data challenges in astronomy, which uh, will directly transfer to the kind of challenges that uh, you're facing in the medical and bioinformatics regimes. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Geoffrey Siwo. I'm a research assistant professor at the University of Notre Dame uh, Center for Research Computing and the EC Institute for Global Health. My talk today is going to focus on how we can think beyond open data, uh, think about how to connect people, uh, computers, and the various emerging technologies like artificial intelligence and machine uh, learning. My talk will focus on three areas. First, I will share a personal story on why I believe that open data is so powerful and will transform science in the future. Second, I'll talk about how thinking about this concept of open science and connecting it with the ability of, the, of computers to, uh, uh, to basically uh, bring together uh, hundreds of people across the world to work on the same problem can help us solve uh, some of the most important biomedical problems uh, faster. And then finally, I'll talk about some of the technical barriers that we might face and how we can address these. And I hope these are issues that we'll be able to discuss during the panel discussions. So let me take you back to 2002 uh, when I was an undergraduate student in Egypt University uh, in Kenya. And back then I became very interested in understanding how uh, virus-like elements in the human genome might interact with HIV. So this was an idea that I couldn't obviously test in a lab. So I went to an, an internet cafe where I could basically access open data. So open data uh, composed of uh, human encoded endogenous retrovirus uh, elements, as well as openly available HIV uh, sequences. And with this data, I was able to test an hypothesis of how HIV could potentially interact with uh, human endogenous uh, uh, retro, uh, retroviruses. And after getting some uh, interesting results from this uh, uh, work that I did back then, uh, it was accepted for a presentation at a conference in uh, Chicago. Uh, and actually, uh, Anthony Fauci became my hero back then because uh, I wrote to him an email uh, asking him to uh, support me to attend this uh, conference. And fortunately, uh, through uh, the help of his office, I was able to attend uh, this conference. But the most important uh, lesson I learned from that was that open data can empower anybody in the world uh, to solve uh, important problems, even with the limited uh, resources. Let's fast forward to what I'm doing today, uh, which is basically uh, exploring ways through which we can use the power of the internet uh, to bring uh, hundreds of people across the world uh, to work on some of the most important uh, biomedical data uh, problems. And I'll give one example of what a project we call the Malaria Dream uh, Challenge Project. And the goal of the project is basically uh, to identify big problems in malaria that could be solved using uh, genomic data and then open these data sets to anyone around the world and invite people to compete to develop models that could, uh, could, uh, uh, could address a specific problem uh, in malaria. So 
this is basically a means of crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing has been successful uh, in many other uh, areas. Uh, and so last year we organized the first Malaria Dream uh, Challenge, uh, whose goal was basically uh, to ask anyone around the world to uh, try and build computer models that could take in uh, gene expression data of malaria parasites across the world and then predict whether those parasites are sensitive or not uh, to a key anti-malarial drug known as uh, artemisinin. And so from this crowdsourcing event that we organized, uh, we learned some very important uh, lessons that I think are applicable across uh, a broad range of areas. So some of the most important lessons we learned is that when you take a problem uh, with data and open it to uh, basically anyone in the world, first of all, you get uh, a huge diversity of solutions, solutions that you as an individual or your lab or your company could not have imagined uh, before. So in this particular Malaria Dream Challenge that we organized, uh, about 360 participants from 31 countries uh, were able to uh, engage uh, in this project in a period of, uh, of three months. So this is a level of productivity that you can imagine that even the biggest company in the world cannot employ hundreds of people to work on the same uh, problem. In addition to that, uh, we also uh, got a wide variety of solutions. So for instance, there were uh, six different pieces of code that were submitted addressing this uh, uh, problem. There were approximately 100 models that were also submitted uh, to address this uh, uh, particular uh, question. So this is a very powerful approach of solving biomedical problems uh, using open uh, data. But of course, it requires that those data be uh, openly accessible. So I would like to highlight some of the barriers and uh, the role that te technologies can play in addressing these uh, uh, barriers. So one of the big challenges uh, in many parts of the world uh, today is that even though data is growing at an exponential scale, uh, there are still data limitations when it comes to specific uh, problems. So for instance, in many areas of biomedical research, uh, there is not a lot of data coming from, uh, coming from the African con continent. So we need more data that is more, uh, is more diverse. We also need to think about more uh, computing frameworks that can handle uh, a wide set of data sets that may not be large. So for instance, uh, in the past few years, artificial intelligence has made enormous progress, but AI as it is today relies on huge amounts of data sets that are not available in many places uh, of the world. So we think we need to think about innovations in AI that could help us to extract meaningful insights from small data sets. The other challenge that we need to address is that there are many reasons why data cannot be shared sometimes. Uh, it could be because of private uh, privacy reasons, it could be security reasons, or it could be also commercial uh, interests. But this, uh, these challenges should not stop us from uh, innovating with, uh, with the data. So we need to think about computing frameworks that can uh, analyze encrypted data without the need for uh, de decryption. Because if we do this, then it means that uh, a wide number of people can actually uh, have access to uh, these data sets uh, without uh, uh, threatening the security or the privacy of those uh, data sets. And two frameworks are uh, the use of pri privacy preserving uh, computing, as well as the use of uh, trusted execution uh, environments, which are new forms of hardware that enable secure analysis of data uh, without uh, outside uh, uh, sharing. We also need to uh, be aware of the need to be transparent with, uh, with the data, uh, to have a way of tracking the provenance of data and models and what people do with those, uh, with those data and models. And I think this is an area that uh, technologies like blockchain uh, can begin uh, to help us address some of the underlying uh, issues. So with that, I would like to thank you for attending this uh, session, and I hope we'll be able to discuss more of how we can address some of the barriers that can prevent the use of uh, data widely. Thank you. DSI Africa, Catherine Lawrence.
Thank you again for joining us for this panel. We, the panelists, and I look forward to discussing these projects with you and answering your questions during the interactive portion of this panel. We encourage you to share your questions on the Chi Storm platform. We'll see you soon.